you go big, go out in the world, who are the people who are living the best? Mm. Who are the people who are living the longest? What are they doing in this world? How are they living? What is their diet and lifestyle like? That's where I start getting excited about a more heavy plant-based diet. Mm. People who are out in the world, in the globe, who are living the longest, healthiest life, have a different lifestyle in general, but one of the big things that they have going for them is that they eat a lot of freaking plants. The goal of the Best You Podcast is to allow you to feel confident about what you need to do, why you need to do it, and how to do it in order to get closer and closer to your best you. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast today. I am super excited because I know we're going to have such a fun interview, but I'm super excited to be joined by the one and only DJ Blattner. DJ, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Ah, thank you. I love the title of your podcast, Best You. Isn't that what it's all about? It's like not being the best somebody else, but like the best you. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Amen. You got it. You got it. You could have you come up with the name yourself too. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I'm excited to dive, in, dive into a lot of you know specifics about nutrition and things of that nature. But the first question I wanted to ask you was, what's something that maybe you used to think was true about proper nutrition, but over time you realized that it is not actually true? Okay, I can answer that in a million ways, but I'm going to answer it true to theme of today, being the author of The Flexitarian Diet, More Plants in Your Diet. Back in the day, before I really knew, I thought it meant you just buy boxes of things that say plant-based chick nuggets, plant-based burgers, plant-based meatballs. And then I thought, oh my gosh, I'm plant-based. Um, but yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no, that's not right. And so actually that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write a book about, you know, how to be more plant-based using a real whole food. Mm. So not just doing a packaged, uh, things that say plant-based on them. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, I think, well, plus, I mean, here's the thing, if you want to go way back, uh, way back, I grew up in a household that was like low fat. We did like the low fat thing back when that was a craze. Um, and when I was in college, uh, I was rollerblading because I am that cool (laughs) because I am that cool. And I am so good at it by the way. But anyway, um, and my foot broke in my skate. Um, and that is when I was like, whoa, I think I need to be uh, studying nutrition because if you just follow fads, if you just follow things that are hot right now, like the low fat diet back in the 90s, um, you can easily get malnourished, even if you're doing that fad right. So having a broken foot and a rollerblade um, really helped guide me into understanding you can't just follow fads. Um even if you do them well, you, you really need to know nutrition science. Mm, yeah, gotcha. So I feel like you kind of talked about it a little bit with that answer, but just to give everybody a little bit more of an overview of kind of the flexitarian diet and how you got to it, I would say just take like a minute or two to kind of introduce to people what you mean when you say the flexitarian diet and kind of how you came to come up with that to be your thing. Yep. So flexitarian is the combination of two words, flexible plus vegetarian, flexitarian. (laughs) So there you go. You can see those sort of coming together, flexible, vegetarian, flexitarian. And so I came up with it because um, I would go to a Cubs game, eat a hot dog. And I would sneak a uh, pork chop in a closet because uh, I was trying to be this vegetarian and I was doing such a bad job. I was a bad vegetarian. Okay. I would eat Thanksgiving turkey with my family and I would feel bad. I would feel bad about all these times that I was, you know, having fun, but also sort of eating meat and claiming that I was this vegetarian. So back in 2003, being this bad vegetarian that I was, um, and I had studied nutrition, by the way, and I knew that plant-based was the powerful way to prevent diseases and uh, longevity and all these things. So that's why I was a vegetarian. I, I had an intent to be as healthy as I could be, um, but doing it such a bad job. Um, and then 2003 comes around and I see the American Dialect Society uh, nominates the most useful word in the English language in 2003 as being flexitarian. And I thought to myself, oh my God, 
gosh. Like this whole like light just went up in my eyes. And I was like, this is what I am. I'm not a bad, lazy vegetarian. I'm a flexible vegetarian. I'm a flexitarian. And so for years, I would basically go to Amazon and bookstores looking for the flexitarian book. I'm like, how to be a flexitarian. And then it was one morning at about 2.30 a.m., I shot out of bed and I was like, it's me. It's me. I'm the one who's supposed to write this book. So I wrote a little quick note to uh, an agent that I found in uh, somebody's book uh, forward, thanking their agent. So I cold emailed an agent and I said, I have this pretty amazing idea and I think it's important to get in the world. And about 15 minutes later, uh, she emailed me back and was like, yeah, I want to rep you. Let's get this book going. Um, so, you know, it's uh, been very much a personal project for me. It's like claiming that, you know, if you want to eat plants, but you want to be flexible about it, there is a way there is a home base and it's flexitarian. Yeah. So before kind of diving into more of the specifics and the nuances of the diet itself, I want to get a little bit more information on you. So, you know, you were a sports nutritionist with the Cubs for about 10 years. So at what point in your journey was this time where you wrote the book? Was it, were you still with the Cubs? Had you already uh, stepped away from that or kind of in your career timeline, when did it go from, I work with the Cubs to now I'm doing my own thing? Uh, the book was before the Cubs. Uh, so I got the Cubs job because I was always on TV and you know, they just knew of me. Um, but the book was before that. It was really like my first uh, big thing that I, you know, I was doing a bunch of media. Um, and so I was able to pitch this book out to the media friends that I had made. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was not as popular as you would think right when it came out, because even like my friends in the nutrition field would be like, is this like where you bridge yoga? Is this like flexibility? Is this like, what is this? Um, so, you know, over the past, you know, since it actually got released in 2009, um, it, the word familiarity, the research on it, uh, is just been growing, growing, growing. So, and then when you, I guess when you worked with the Cubs, is this the kind of the diet that was coached to a lot of the players and the athletes? So when you do uh, pro sports, uh, a lot of it is you're offering a lot of different options, right? So people get to eat for their best you. Um, so I would say, yes, uh, there were always plant-based options out and true to form. Uh, and you could be flexible with uh, how often you choose it, what you choose. So I, I definitely am a supporter of the word flexible. Um, even when it comes to being a flexitarian, there's, there's different ways to even go about it. Gotcha. Okay. I like it. I, I agree. Um, so I want to kind of dive into a little bit more of the specifics. And, you know, one of the things this talks so much about is animal protein. Is it better? Is it not? If you're vegetarian, um, where do you get your protein sources and stuff like that? So talk to me a little bit about why, you know, I know you talk about how most people should have less animal protein than maybe they currently do. Talk about why that is and then what versions of animal protein maybe they shouldn't have or they shouldn't have. Ah, I'm going to switch the whole focus for you. Do it. So flexitarian diet isn't about being anti-meat. It's not about taking meat out of your diet. It's actually the opposite. It's about being pro-plants, how to add more plants to your diet. So I actually, when I start working with somebody, I really do not say, where are you eating all these animals? Let's get them out. I'm just pro plants. And we say, hey, let's figure out ways we can get more plants in. And if sometimes that means eating a little less steak to eat a bean burrito, if sometimes that means making your stir fry without chicken and making it with edamame, if sometimes that means, you know, uh, giving up a lunch meat uh, to do something like a chickpea salad, that's great. So it really is very, very different from a typical vegetarian style where you do talk to the author and she, he, uh, they are saying to you, uh, yeah, get that meat out. It's like, no, that's not what we're about. We're just about saying hey, where you can think about some swaps here and there. Yeah. I, I like to, I like some of those. I want to see if you can maybe come up with on the spot, a few of those other examples of where people can switch it out. Because I think a lot of people are looking for strategies of like where, where and how, where and how really, how can I be getting in more plants uh, to my diet? So get maybe a few more examples, maybe like on the go or like quick examples. And I feel like that's a lot of, a lot of times the most difficult for people to get 
plants in when they're trying to get something quick and quick and easy? Yeah. So I have three steps to being a flexitarian. So uh, swapping is one of them and we'll get to it. But the, the three steps really is one, keep eating what you're eating and just shift the ratios. Like do not have to reinvent the wheel here. Like shifting the ratios means instead of maybe an eight ounce uh, steak or chicken breast or something, you know, maybe it's six, <laughs> you know, maybe it's a little bit less and that you're eating more vegetables with that meal, right? So it's like, you're still getting your proteins where you know, uh, but it's like you're pumping up the veggies a little bit more. Great. Step two is more of the swapping that we're talking about is just look, taking a look at your protein mix. So even if you weren't going to do more plant-based proteins, even if you were just looking at your protein mix and you say, my goodness, in a week, pretty much all I eat is chicken for protein. That's a miss. So even varying your protein mix of animal foods, making sure that you're eating, you know, the fatty fish along with the pork and the beef and the chicken and the eggs and the dairy, like playing around with the, even the animal food protein mix is a good idea. And then working in things like lentils and beans, um, which are sound like, oh my gosh, lentils and beans, but there's a billion types of lentils and beans and a billion ways that you can make it. So we could talk about that. So swapping is the second way. And the third way actually is, I think one of the most important is to experiment once a week with a vegetarian plant-based recipe. If you do that, if you commit to one recipe a week um, that you get from the internet, from a friend, from a trainer, wherever, um, from the, the Instagram, um, you will have you know over 50 recipes tested and tried. Some are garbage. Some are you will never want to eat again. Some become maybe like five to 10 of them become like you. They become your go-tos for on the go, for your lunch, for your breakfast. So, so I am a big proponent of doing it that way. Um, when it comes to the swaps, as we were talking about, it really is just look at what you usually eat and pretty much any chicken or beef could be swapped out for beans and lentils. Those are probably the highest um, used plant-based protein. So let me give you an example here of what I call bean math. Okay. So if you were going to swap in, say, you know, we want to do a blended burger that's half beans, half meat, every ounce of meat that you take out, you would put in about a fourth of a cup of cooked beans or lentils. That's the bean math for you to start doing some swaps in your own life. And again, it doesn't have to be hundred percent. You don't have to be like, you know, I go from beef tacos to lentil tacos, although delicious. And I recommend it. Um, you could go half and half for a while. So wh what is the, the reasoning behind do, ma making making the swap, like why do we want to make? And like I know you said, you're more add in plants and not remove, um, not not eat animal proteins. But still, I like I want to know from a your opinion slash your research perspective, what is the reason that we should make some of these swaps some of the time? It's good. Actually, uh, in media training, the number one question to ask always is, who cares? What's in it for me? Yeah. Like, you know, why do it, right? So I'm going to answer it two ways. The first way I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the perspective I have is global nutrition. And then two, let's talk about some actual research here. So when you look at global nutrition, not just the incestuous nutrition advice you get in America. So an American dietitian, I am, I've studied from America. I hear ideas from America. And so we just kind of keep giving each other the same biohacking, like, you know, advice all over. If you go big, go out in the world, who are the people who are living the best? Who are the people who are living the longest? What are they doing in this world? How are they living? What is their diet and lifestyle like? That's where I start getting excited about a more heavy plant-based diet. People who are out in the world, in the globe, who are living the longest, healthiest life, have a different lifestyle in general. But one of the big things that they have going for them is that they eat a lot of freaking plants. And so I love that because that is, you know, what you can see happening in the real world. Then when you actually look at the research, plant-based diets, not necessarily exclusively plants, but plant-based diets do many things. They uh, improve longevity. I'm obsessed with that. And not just a lifespan. I don't just want to live a long time. I want a health span, baby. Like I want to live a long time healthfully. I want to live a long time well. Um, so we know plant-based diets have more fiber, 
more vitamins, more minerals, more phytonutrients in them to help with that longevity angle. Then when you look at research on chronic disease, so this is heart disease, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, plant-based diets help with all of those things, reducing risk. Um, and then you look at weight maintenance and weight management and people who follow more plant-based tend to weigh less than an omnivore. Uh, so for those reasons of global nutrition and research, uh, it's exciting. And again, I get intimidated personally by hearing plant-based because I'm like, whoa, I feel like that's aggressive. Like what's happening here? That's why if you just plop that word flexible in front of it, we do know that you can be flexible. You don't have to eat exclusively plants, only plants. You can eat mostly plants um, and still have all of those benefits. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I especially love that first one because I feel like that's one one thing that a lot of people don't like talk about or think about as much in regards to like, let's look at other people around the world and who's living the best, who's living the longest, who's living healthfully the longest, like you said, and let's see what they're doing and try to model that to a certain extent. So with that said, where, where are people living the longest healthfully and what are some of their lifestyle differences, maybe nutrition and maybe other words that uh, otherwise that maybe we can start to implement? Well, if I get on any uh, awards, like the flexitarian diet wins all sorts of good diet awards. And who am I always neck and neck with? Who are we always in competition together with? The Mediterranean diet, which by the way, I mean, are basically the same. <laughs> flexitarian diet and Mediterranean diet are practically the same. So no wonder why we're always on these lists together. But that is who people living in the Mediterranean tend to be the people with the longest health spans. And to your point, it's very much a flexitarian type plant-based diet. There is probably a little bit more of an emphasis on healthy fats, although they are in the flexitarian diet. Um, you know, really you know, the glugs of olive oil that we all hear about, right? The more fatty fish. Uh, the smash plus tea fish, like the salmon, the mackerel, the anchovies, the sardines, the herring, the tuna, all of those things, um, the nuts and seeds, all of that still in a flexitarian diet, but probably more emphasized in a Mediterranean diet. But what do they have in addition to their diet? They have awesome exercise, right? They have awesome exercise. That is not just an hour class four days a week. Like it is a freaking lifestyle exercise. They're walking to the market. They're walking to work. They're doing walking, um, you know, during the day for just like getting fresh air. So it's like they have a cool sense of lifestyle fitness, which I think, you know, <laughs> we don't, <laughs> yeah. we don't in general. And they have a very relaxed relationship with food. They eat real food, but they also do it with others. They have a lot of socializing around it. Um, you know, focus on that sort of uh, real food thing. Not like, oh my gosh, people are coming over. I better warm up the pizza rolls. <laughs> you know, it's like, it really is like putting olives out on the table and the nuts and seeds and, you know, veggie trays. And it's very, it's a romantic relationship with food and not so judgmental uh, as we are here in the US. Um, so, it, I mean, I, you know, I romanticize it, but it is so much of it is true. And then, you look at the just portions in general and the style of eating, you know, it's more relaxed, it's more romantic, it's chewing and enjoying your food. It's actually sitting at a table, eating from a plate and enjoying your food as opposed to, you know, US it's like, uh, I'm on the, in the middle of an email and I'm shoving my lunch in or like I'm standing in the fridge. Oops, I guess I just ate dinner standing in the fridge, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, like when you said that, I was like, when people are asking me about advice and like, what are some like good on the go options? Cause I'm always eating on the go. I think the, like the first thing isn't trying to give them some options. The second thing is like, why are you always eating on the go? Like, why can't you just sit down and like be in some peace and quiet and, and eat a meal? So I think that was pretty eye opening for me. And then the thing that I love that you said that they do is that, you know, have a more relaxed relationship with food. And so that just had me thinking, how can everybody has such an uptight relationship with food. I feel like nowadays, especially in, in America, what are some things that we can start to do to relax that relationship? 
Yeah, I, I think, thank you for doing the call out on the piece of advice I give for most of my clients that I see is called table plate chair. It's basically <laughs> like, listen, all you need is three things to really eat well. If you have a table plate and a chair, you're pretty close. You're pretty close because, you know, like the standing thing or eating while you're on a computer or, you know, walking down the street or whatever. Um, the first time I became aware of the style of relaxation around food and sort of the mindful single tasking of it is when I uh, first um, did my first trip to Europe and I was going to go get a coffee on the go. And there was no option for somebody to pour me a cup of coffee in a cup and walk. If I wanted coffee, I would stand with the locals, drink the coffee, eat the little uh, cookie that came with it on the plate. And then I'd go about my day. And I was like, who are these people? This is amazing. So I actually think the first step is really to let yourself eat when you're eating single task. And even if that is five minutes, if it's five minutes more than you used to do, I think that is a beautiful way to like, look at what you're eating, taste what you're eating and then move on. And then, you know, do the deadlines, do the emails, run to the meeting, whatever. Um, so, I, you know, I think that really is a basic, but powerful first step and hard. I got to tell you, it's hard. When I first started doing it, I was like, wow, I didn't realize how much I don't sit at a table or eat from a plate and snacks included. I mean, you know, how many times would I just snack uh, rushing around or doing an email? So um, powerful, but simple. Yeah. I'm like that. I was table plate and chair. That's awesome. It's like if you, if <laughs> more often than not, if you can have you know, everybody talks about, you know, flexible people say 80, 20 have, if you can eat 80% of your foods with the table plate and chair, you're probably going to be pretty good. Yeah. I, yeah. And it, it goes sort of on the momentum that uh, we're seeing about, you know, this idea of mindful eating and intuitive eating and, you know, how, it, how to do that stuff. And really the, yeah, the first step is just like being there with your food and paying attention, you know, looking at it. <laughs> like I call it visual wisdom where you look at a meal before you eat and you sort of look and say like, do I have vegetables on here enough? Like, do I have a protein that seems to be a mix from what I usually do? Are these grains whole grains? You know, is there a good fat on this plate? Does it satisfy me mentally? Does it also optimize me physically? Like, does it have all those parts? And like, you can quickly just look at a plate and have that visual wisdom and be like, ah, I probably should shove some spinach on this plate. <laughs> There's really not enough. Sure, it's avocado toast, but man, where's your actual greens, you know, or whatever. Um, so, I, so I love that idea of sitting down and looking at it and using your know-how in nutrition and health um, in that moment. Yeah, I like that. That's the visual wisdom and satisfy you both nutritionally and uh, mentally. That's good. That's good. Next thing I want to kind of dive into is the idea of gluten. And when people say they go gluten-free, the bad ways to go gluten-free and, and when we should be concerned whether or not we're having gluten. So I guess before even kind of diving into that conversation, just briefly talk about what gluten is and then kind of when, how gluten-free can be done improperly and, and when we should be concerned about it. Okay. So gluten is in wheat, uh, rye, and barley. That's where, that's where gluten is. It's in those three grains. Uh, it's a protein in those grains. And what has really happened is that many people have gone gluten-free and feel better. And so we start hearing this. We're like, oh my gosh, you know, I need to go gluten-free. This is amazing. They feel so good. Um, but what really is happening when people do gluten-free well um, is that they start eating more whole foods. They don't eat as much pizza crust uh, and white rolls and white bread and white cookies and white cupcakes. And all of a sudden they're like, what else is there to eat? Oh my gosh, I eat whole grains and I eat much fruits and vegetables and I eat more proteins. Um, and so all of a sudden their diet quality becomes better. So for many people, it's not necessarily just cutting gluten out of their diet. It's that they improve their overall diet quality on accident. Right. Um, and so that's what's really happening when someone feels better doing a gluten-free diet for the most part. Now, of course, there are outliers where people actually have celiac disease and do not eat gluten because it ruins their intestinal tract. Um, so yes, but for the most part, this higher quality carbs and higher quality diet is what's really in play. Um, so if you think about it, uh, you know, 
what does that actually mean? It means you can do gluten-free horribly wrong. <laughs> you can do it horribly wrong. Just like plant-based, you can do it horribly wrong by seeing uh, this advertising on the front of a package and say, oh my gosh, this is gluten-free. This is safe and good for me. That is untrue. So plant-based and gluten-free are both what you call health halos, meaning manufacturers love to slap them on because when people who don't know what they're doing see them on a package, they buy the stuff. So the advice that I would have is anytime you see plant-based or even gluten-free on a label is to not care. Flip it over and look at one thing, and that's the ingredient list. And if you see quality carbs in there from whole grain oats or from um, sprouted grains, even better, um, then you're like, oh, okay, this is actually made out of food. And it's not just a bunch of gums and rando starches that are claiming that they're plant-based or gluten-free. Um, so, so anyway, I, obviously I get passionate about this topic <laughs> <laughs> because I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a sucker for marketing. I don't want anybody else to be a sucker for marketing. And that is what is happening in so much of this plant-based and gluten-free uh, vibe and how people can do pretty darn healthy diets wrong, you know, cause there's lots of naturally gluten-free foods that people can do right, you know, with the sweet potatoes and the white potatoes and uh, oats, which most people think have gluten, but it's mostly just cross-contamination um, and processing. But anyway, um, you know, it's, so it's then plantains when you think about it and brown rice and quinoa and amaranth and like all these things are naturally gluten-free and great. They're important part of your diet. Cause that's the final thing and thought I have here is that just like I preach protein mix, I preach high quality carbohydrate mix. So if I get a client who's like, I eat whole wheat all day long, it's not that it has gluten that I get sort of like, we got to change that. It's because you don't need to eat whole wheat all day long. You need some quinoa in there. You need some sweet potato in there. You need some, uh, you know, uh, brown rice in there. You need to throw in a good mix of all of those quality carbs too. Yeah, that's that's so true and so good. So I'll make sure that everybody realizes they shouldn't eat gluten-free Oreos. Those are not actually uh, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> it's like- no, Right, right. Yeah, um, that's great, that's great. Um, I'm interested because I know I have a lot of uh, training clients who have, and kind of me personally, have sweet tooth. So what is your kind of, go-to recommendation for people who, I know it probably, you know, depends on the person and, and everything like that, but what do you try to recommend to people who have sweet tooth and, and that is one of their Achilles heel to maintaining good health? We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first, I wanted to share a quick testimonial from a past participant of the 10-week transformation program. I started running the 10WT in the beginning of 2020 and I've had over 150 people on counting go through it and they've seen amazing results both inside and out. If you're inspired to join after listening to the testimonial, then go to nickcarrier.com to learn more. We'll get back to the episode in just a minute, but first, here's what they had to say. Hi, I'm Hillary, and I joined the 10-week program for overall fitness goals to work on weight loss and just overall well-being goals. So far, I've lost 12 pounds. Uh, I've gained a lot more muscle. I feel like my endurance has increased, and I've made a lot of new friends. And my favorite thing about the program is all the friends that I've met also, just holding myself more accountable in different areas of life. I feel like I've improved in nutrition, fitness, and just well-being. You should join the next 10-week program. Well, so many, like you said, there's so many factors here. One thing that I do a lot of time is just make sure that the person is actually eating enough and uh, on schedule. Because uh, sweet is a, to our human body, is a quick energy. And so I think to myself, like, why is this person's blood sugar low enough that they are seeking, their human body is seeking quick energy. So uh, so I make sure that they're eating enough and on schedule and that their meals have the right visual wisdom ratios, right? That there's protein, enough of it, you know, that there's whole grains, which uh, are so important also for regulating the sweet tooth because 
so many people cut out carbs and then they wonder, why is my body craving carbohydrates? And it's like, well, if you eat the good ones during a meal, right, you are less likely to crave the quick ones later. So making sure meals have that protein, they have the whole grain piece. You're not just cutting it out all the time. Um, they have the lots of bulk with fruits and vegetables and good fats to sustain you, um, you know, three, four, five hours, six hours apart, whatever it is when you get hungry. Um, so anyway, that's the first thing that I do with a sweet tooth is just make sure those basic foundations are, are there. Uh, oftentimes that's helpful in and of itself. Um, secondly is I really do encourage natural sugar through fruit. So I oftentimes see a pattern with people with a sweet tooth, they don't have very much fruit in their diet. And we're supposed to have one or two cups a day, just base baseline, just for the basics. So I'll take somebody, once I do that first step, the second step is I say, okay, are we getting enough natural sugar in there so that your body gets the sugar it craves, but in a matrix of awesome, whole food, fabulous, right? So then we do that. And then third, I oftentimes will take that fruit and try and make it into like fancy fruit desserts. Like the classic would be, you know, banana and ice cream, you know, turning it into chocolate uh, mint uh, or mint chip kind of thing, or turning it into strawberry peanut butter or turning it into, uh, you know, coconut, unsweetened coconut flakes um, and cocoa nibs, whatever. So taking that banana as the base of sweet and then playing with that. Um, but I'm also going to say that I am uh, notorious uh, for my chickpea cookie dough. <laughs> so it's like blending up chickpeas and nut butter um, as a base, which sounds, I think, bizarre. I think, how could that possibly be so good? It is so delicious. And then putting in your favorite type of um, chocolate chip. And I put vanilla, a little sea salt in there too. But you know, chocolate chips these days could be dark chocolate, which is lower in sugar than milk chocolate. Or it could even be like stevia sweetened for somebody who's looking for, you know, really a low, low to no sugar added sugar lifestyle. Um, so, but keep in mind, I'm using added sugar here because natural sugar is probably the problem. Most of the time people aren't getting enough of it, of the good stuff. And so they're craving, you know, more of the quick stuff. That was good. That was good. I think, um, like you said, if you have a sweet tooth, make sure you're eating enough and on schedule, getting in the natural sugars. And then I need to figure out what your, uh, again, like more specifics with a recipe of that, uh, what something cookie dough? What did you call it? The healthy cookie dough? Chickpea. It's chickpea, chickpea, yeah. Chickpea, nut butter. And then, oh my gosh, like that to me, I, that sounds amazing to me. So I hope other people think the same thing. I'm going to, uh, once we stop recording, I'm going to figure out exactly what you put in there. Um, okay. that's awesome. It's One on my I'm, website. It's on my website. People love it. It is like a little cult obsession. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay. I think that one of the things that's really important is kind of identifying the recommendation, maybe differences for men and for women. Um, and I, you know, that's not necessarily blanket differences, but what have you, I guess, found that I feel from my experience with clients and stuff, nutrition complications are always a little bit tougher sometimes with women with hormonal balances and stuff like that. So what are some things that women need to be aware of when coming up with what they eat and, and their diet that necessarily men don't need to be as aware of, I guess. So here you're right in terms of women and extra like hormone balance. Uh, we got a lot going on. We got a lot going on, you know? Um, but also men tend to have more muscle mass and tend to be bigger and taller. Um, and so part of that, it gets tricky because that visual wisdom, men and women both need those same ratios. We both need a little protein on our plate, a little whole grain on our plate, lots of veggies on our plate, fat. But the trick for women is because we have by nature less muscle mass, we tend to be shorter, uh, tend to weigh less, um, it's smaller amounts. Um, and not necessarily smaller amounts that you're starving, because that always backfires. If we know one thing, we know that hungry people make horrible decisions. <laughs> so like, you know, so it's like you can't 
diet, you're going to binge eat. You can't under eat, you're going to binge eat. Um, so it's like, but how do I stay in tune with how much to eat when I'm a woman, especially when, you know, portions in America are so huge. You're around men who are eating a ton and then you're like, oh gosh. So it's not necessarily the change in what, it's really amounts that I have seen uh, with women and tuning in, using our intuition um, to figure out like, what is the right amount today versus tomorrow? on this active day versus maybe a not active day. So it's like, you know, it's also not a one size fits all, even within the person that it's like, well, this is how much you eat today. It's like, you got to really pay attention. And that's why table plate chair comes into, uh, into mind here too, is that it really helps you sort of tap in and listen a little bit more um, to the, how much uh, issue. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's so true. And, and they, have it difficult when they are, when, you know, when you're around men and we eat so damn much, a lot, a lot of us do. And, and like you said, the portion sizes are just insane. Um, like I'm, I know any, I love Chipotle, but they make those bowls freaking massive and I'm not <laughs> complaining about it, but when a Chipotle bowl can be 1200 calories sometimes, you know, obviously a guy doesn't need that either, but it's, it's going to be a little bit even worse if uh, a smaller, a smaller girl, who doesn't, who doesn't need all that. Um, but yeah, no, I think that, I think that's really, I think that's really crucial to make sure that, you know, women, when you're around men who are eating a lot, don't think you need to like eat the same amount or, or compete with the number of calories that they take in. Um, yeah, it's tricky. And it's like, maybe some days it is. And some days it's a lot less. And that's why, you know, it's scary because it's like, oh my gosh, are you telling me not to follow a book or a guide? And then I just have to tap in and I'll know. And it's like, you know, it is true that we were born and we could do it. We had the innate skill to figure out when we were done and when we needed food. And so it's like how to tap into that when you have so many messages, so much judgment about food. Like it is, it's hard to listen when you're so busy and distracted. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a practice. And for most people, you know, it's uh, always a practice. Like you never totally have it licked. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, I've got a, I've got a few more questions. The first couple are, are pretty practical because I know people. I honestly like don't even like asking necessarily the question that I'm going to ask, but I, I know everybody else will benefit from it because it's questions that they like to ask others. So, you know, you already you already talked about, and, and this is what I try to tell people as well. Like when you're looking at a nutrition label, don't look at gluten free. Don't look at this. Not even necessarily the macros first. Look at the ingredients first. And obviously less is better. And when, if you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Um, do you personally ever count calories, count macros? Um, if so, why or why or why not? So thank you for giving everybody the ingredient uh, message. So my second book is called Superfood Swap. And uh, the subtitle is How to Eat What You Crave Without the Crap. And CRAP is actually an acronym I came up with um, for my parents because they uh, were like, oh, you know, we're starting to eat healthier. We bought all of our food at Whole Foods. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's not how you determine if something is healthy or not. Um, so the ingredients, uh, I tell people to look for CRAP. C is chemicals you don't use in your kitchen regularly, right? It's like chemicals. Um, R is the refined sugar and flour. That's the white stuff. That's huge. R is everybody's problem. Um, A, artificial flavors, colors, sweeteners, and P is preservatives. So if you see something in the ingredient list that falls under CRAP, you know, maybe if it's one of those things, it's not like a total deal breaker. But if you start seeing a couple of these things, that is a red flag that you can do better. So first, uh, I definitely think about using the CRAP acronym to teach people how to read the ingredients. Um, I think it's huge. Um, and then you asked about calories. I do something called calorie consciousness. So people who are calorie clueless, that's not a way to live. Uh, people who are calorie counters tend to be pretty obsessive and stop looking at the quality of things and really are starting to just sort of miss the boat when it comes to how to eat. Um, so there's this middle ground between being clueless and being like sort of obsessed counter. Um, and that's just conscious. And what that means is I don't count the calories, but I use visual wisdom. I look at my plate and this is what I teach clients to do. And I sort of in my head say, are all the pieces there? If I have a little protein and I have a little grain, I have some fat and a lot of vegetables, the calories 
tend to work out on their own. They count themselves because I have that right visual wisdom that I don't have this huge, massive piece of protein. I don't have this huge lump of pasta. You know, it's like a little bit, a little bit and lots of vegetables, which happen to be pretty darn good for you, but also accidentally very low in calories. (laughs) So uh, although not counting, that is visual wisdom, calorie consciousness. Yeah, I think it's an awesome phrase. And I think people are going to like, light up when they hear that calorie consciousness because I mean, it's that balance, right? Of not being completely clueless, but not obsessing because first off, it's a bad, it's not a recipe for a relaxed relationship with food. And second, it's just usually more work than people are willing to sustain over a long period of time, um, which is a huge key to it as well. Um, second to last question, there's probably going to be a lot of different things that come to your mind, but if you could say five foods that you try to eat every single week, <laughs> like, I know it's gonna be hard. If there's like five foods that you're like, on a weekly basis, I have to have this because they're super important to my health, then what are those five? Ah, this is an interesting one. So um, I'm going to always have to start with leafy greens. They literally, if there's nothing that you ever do, but just have a shit ton of leafy greens in your fridge and shove them in everything that you eat and drink, uh, amen. Hallelujah. Like that is my guiding principle. It's my guiding star. Okay. <laughs> like that is, I definitely think that is huge. Right. So leave it greens. Um, and then let's think about, you know, the protein foods in my world. I will say the beans and lentils, although it's a large category, it, it is definitely a category that I make sure is always in my grocery cart, whether that's roasted chickpeas for a snack or whether that's black beans uh, or lentils that I'm going to put into a burrito bowl, or whether that's edamame I'm going to put in a stir fry. Like I love to have that category of food sort of filled out. So leafy greens, beans and greens, come on. Of course, the dietitian is going to start with those. So those are good. Um, and then, you know, uh, I think quinoa is an interesting food for me. Um, I love buying it frozen, already cooked with no other ingredients. I feel like it is such a quick way to get satisfaction. Like, you know, if I'm like, you know, my sale is not really doing it for me. Yeah. Throw some quinoa in there. (laughs) It'll make you feel so much better. Um, so I sort of love that, but it was in a tie for oats too, because I love oats, uh, because they can make so many things. So I, I don't know where I go there. That's a tie for that. Um, and then, uh, I think for fats, Oh, that's, I got to say, I mean, I'm avocado obsessed, but is that like so basic these days? Like, it's like, can you really say that? (laughs) Um, But like, you know, it's just, it can be so many things, right? You can mash up avocado and melt dark chocolate chips with it and get yourself the coolest like truffles. You can smash it on a piece of toast and have a quick breakfast. You know, you can put it in a pretty boring veggie wrap and feel like, oh my gosh, this is like mayonnaise, like nature's mayonnaise. I love it. Um, So I love that. Um, So I'm going to err on the side of being basic. So I love that. Um, And then I guess nuts um, and seeds. I don't know where I would be without snacking on those. Like, I just think they are the best um, you know, and, and I include in that like nut butters and things like, oh, I just love to stick a carrot stick in almond butter. Like, come on, like, that's so good. Um, I don't know where I'm at. I could go on and I have so many love relationships <laughs> with food. How many was that? That was fine. That was good. That was, oh, okay, that was fine. That was perfect. No, I think that was great. That was great. And obviously, like you said, you're, you're passionate about a lot of different foods. And I just know that, um, a lot of people, so many of, you know, people in my, who listen to the best you podcast are fitness focused and they're always trying to uh, improve their nutritional habits. And, and I think giving practical stuff like that is, is really key. And I know everybody's going to absolutely love those. So before I ask the last question though, DJ, I just want to acknowledge you because first off, you're freaking awesome. You're an abs- been an absolute blast to have on. I know everybody has had, not just they've gotten a lot of wisdom, but they've had a lot of fun listening to you today. And I just love a lot of the different kind of like intermediary um pieces of advice or, or tips or phrases that you use, like the flexitarian, you know, it's not super strict, but it's flexible and you can do these different things. I love the table plate and chair. I love the relaxed relationship with food. I love uh, the con- calorie conscious, not obsessed or anything like that. So many of those things are are just what people need to hear and not think that they need to jump, jump to one extreme or the other with their diet. And so I just want to acknowledge you for giving that message to everybody. Thank you. I feel so good. You have made me smile and just boosted my self-esteem. Thank you. (laughs) Good. Good. That's awesome. That's awesome.
Awesome. Well, um, and everybody's going to want to go learn more about you and want to learn more about the flexitarian diet. So make sure you guys go follow her on Instagram at DJ Blattner and on the other, other social medias as well. And you can find her website at djblattner.com where you can go find that uh, chickpea cookie dough. Uh, I know that's, that's, that's where I'm going. Um, any other place that people should go learn more about you and, and get more info? No, nope, those are the two hubs. Those are the best hubs. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, last question, DJ, is that I think that getting closer to the best version of your, yourself is both a constant journey and a unique journey. I'm not sure if we're ever, if we ever get to that best version of ourselves. And I think that the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So for you personally, if there are three things that you can currently do or currently work on to get closer to that best version of DJ Blattner that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? All right. So here we go. One is always water. I got 99 problems and 87 of them are because I don't drink enough water. Like (laughs) bottom line, I am always working on this. People always know I'm working on it. I've got strategies at the wazoo. So nonetheless, it's always going to be water for me. Hydration, hydration, hydration. Uh, Number two is more consistency with my insight timer meditation. It is magic. It helps me connect to such creativity and peace. And I just love it. You can go on the app and find all sorts of different meditations for what you're looking for. Man voice, woman voice, music, no music, five minutes, 20 minutes. I love it. So um, I think that's huge. Uh, And then the third thing um, is I have a standing desk adapter. I use it, but not as much as I would like to. So using my current standing desk adapter more because, you know, sitting is the worst. (laughs) So like having more standing in my life is um, something I I think is, you know, why I bought the adapter in the first place. I just got to use it a little bit more. Yeah. Well, you need to start recording podcasts at that standing desk. Yes, exactly. Why am I sitting down right now? I mean, <laughs> come on. I do have, hey, I do have some hydration here at least. I mean, I'm about almost halfway done. So what can I say? Yeah. I don't know if you took a sip the entire interview, but. <laughs> 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 well, see, that's why it's on my list of things that I'm um, working toward for yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, three great <laughs> things, DJ. Uh, ton of fun today. And I know a lot of people are going to enjoy it. So I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.